my computer. There, welcome. This is the Implementation Lab for Intention, which is our January 2018 theme. And we are here on December 20th, just before all the holidays break loose. And I really appreciate the um, participation of you guys, because I imagine that your life has been pretty busy these last few weeks, getting everything in place for our children and our families to have wonderful memories of this season. So thank you on behalf of the Solutions team for everything that you're doing right now. So um, I thought I'd start with one of the quotes from the packet. This is by Parker Palmer. Before you tell your life what you intend to do, make sure you listen for what it intends to do with you. I'm going to light our chalice. For the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. There it is, right over my shoulder, burning brightly like all of our Christmas lights do. And welcome uh, to the mysterious number person there. We love to have you join us, and you can lurk, you can contribute, whatever works. And we are recording this by the way, so we will have it for our colleagues who couldn't make us today. So the theme is intention. By way of introduction, I thought that I would share with you one of the things that happened in our brainstorm two months ago, Bob. I can't believe it was so long ago. Um, but one of our colleagues brought to mind the difference between intention and resolution. And that seemed to be, to be a really nice lens to look at um, for January. And the, in what, it, what it came out was that a resolution is something we make in New Year's, which is perfect for January. And it's a pulling out for us. You make a resolution, you lose 10 pounds, you're going to get in shape, all those fantastic things that people always say. What the difference is between a resolution and intention is that an intention pulls us in. And that inward recognition of our, our nature means that it's okay to make mistakes. That was the big deal. When we make resolutions after the 10 days, which is about how long my resolutions last, we say, oh, I'm never gonna do this. I'm going to just go ahead I'm not going to change any of my habits. When you have an intention, you come back to it again and again. And the Buddhists recognize that failure is part of making an intention. So I find it very relaxing and much more easy to try to set an intention. The, last, the second thing I wanted to say about the packet is that... Um, I'm going to do speaker view for a second. Oh, no, I'm not. We're going to do gallery view. Is that with that allowance for making intentions, one of the things that I've realized over my career as a religious educator is that we as Unitarian Universalists have no um, ceremonies or rituals for forgiveness and mistakes. I think that comes from our, our idealism that has emerged over our history from the early, uh, actually turn of the 1900th century. We are idealists, and so as a result, it's hard for us to admit that we make mistakes, even though making mistakes is part of being human. And so if you think about it, the Catholics have the, the confession, or more modern Catholics call it the ceremony of reconciliation. The Jews have the Day of Atonement. 
to my knowledge, we do not have any ceremonies of mistakes and reconciliation in our Unitarian Universalist bandwidth. And so one of the things I suggest in the packet is that we present this to the children and say, how would you create a ritual for making a mistake and asking for forgiveness? And Leah posted uh, on our Facebook page, our RE support, support Facebook page, that she was really intrigued with this idea and she's going to bring it forward into her program in January and is looking forward to sharing the ideas on Facebook and with others and what, what comes up with this. So that's one of the big umbrella things about intention that's in that packet. And it's actually a huge omission in our faith. And so I hope that we as religious educators being agents as radical transformation, which is one of the things that it was defined for, for me way back in the nineties, that we are agents of radical transformation. We might bring this to our faith, a ritual for mistakes and forgiveness. Okay. So that's sort of an overview. Some of the thinking I had, what have been the challenges as you looked at this packet, and maybe you haven't gotten a chance to look at it yet, but as you looked at this packet, what have you noticed might be a challenge for you? One of my challenges um, in dealing with uh, soul matters in general, and, and this month is yet another example, there's a raft of uh, books and um, and other materials that that are uh, made available and and, uh, and pointed to. And one of the struggles I have in my congregation is that we have a whole bunch of books scattered all around the church buildings. We have several buildings, and there are books in different places. And I have no idea whether we have any of those books that are listed. Mm. Um, so um, I'm actually, um, I'm already thinking forward about what I might do to resolve it, uh, but I'm also open to hearing other thoughts. But one of the challenges is um, making those materials actually available to uh, the teachers who are going to be sharing this material with uh, children and youth. Finding it and making it available to them. Great. Yep. Great. I'm, I think what I, I'll do. I also suspect that I also suspect that there are members of the congregation who might have some of these materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do I how do I uh, open that up so that so the teachers actually have those materials available to them. We can't afford to buy every one of those things. Yeah. So how, how do we make them available? Wonderful, good question. And so the way our guided conversation works is we bring forth our challenges first, and then we're going to address all of the possible solutions that exist in our yeah. minds. Yeah, so that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I can picture my old library too. I have trouble with this one back here, and <laughs> it's my own. <laughs> All right. Um, is there another one of us that would like to share a challenge? Oh, yes, Carolyn. Ready? Um, so I guess I would say a challenge uh, for me is um, I have two challenges. Uh, one is that it's just been difficult to staff the month of January and looking around a little bit at what people, oh, everybody's frozen. I don't know if y'all are hearing me. I can hear you fine. And you, okay. 
And you aren't frozen to me. Oh, good. My network bandwidth is low. I have a little message. Okay. <laughs> I'll continue then. Yeah. So it's been challenging to staff January, and um, I think I figured out a solution, but it means um, carrying forward a volunteer who is one of my volunteers that likes to kind of like work um, fly by the seat of their pants a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm not always sure what I'm going to get, um, but they're an excellent presence in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like in some ways, like I, I, I find it like that this method of planning is almost like tailor made for someone like that. Um, so I'm trying to think about like how to offer these resources in a way that really works with like that person, like organization style and communication piece because I like to know what's being planned and this is a guide uh, and workshop leader that uh, really starts to provide that for me. Um, but then when I go and observe, I, I love what I see. So maybe some tips about just like really embracing the gifts of the folks that you have volunteering um, and, and how to help them take a little bit more structure uh, and guide um, and then I would say other challenge that I'm working with is um, distractions. And the third challenge that I'm working with is um, I'm about four months into this idea of use, doing like a children's chapel for my first Sunday. And I find that because we're doing monthly themes, if I plan the first one and then we have months like every month that has like a holiday where kids have a three day weekend from school. Um, I don't, I don't always know how, how, I don't know if the, if, I don't know if my volunteers are feeling like invested enough in the curriculum because sometimes they're only planning like two sessions if we have something special happening because of a holiday weekend. So that's just sort of like a format challenge. Okay. Well, Say Say a little more about the chapel structure that you're starting. Uh, so I'm leading a multi-age group with uh, our first and second grade group and our third and fourth grade group. That's for the whole RE session. But the RE session does begin with the kids in um, the, the big worship service. Okay. And so we have about following their, their time in the, the full worship. All right. Just a few little challenges there for you, Carolyn. Great. Yeah, it's great. Those are those are good ones too. I know I've heard them before. So that's wonderful. Um, other challenges from uh, maybe Kathleen, unless Kathleen just would like to lurk, or our six one seven area code audio. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. And if you don't, hi, hi. Oh, there you go. Hi, I'm, I'm your mystery person. <laughs> My name is Ellen Quadgraf. I'm, um, I'm at the uh, Westminster Church in Rhode Island. And uh, my question has to do with combining the theme of the month with Martin Luther King Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, I loved your intro, uh, expanding on this idea of intent versus resolution and the forgiveness piece. Um, and I feel like that may be an angle into um, Martin Luther King someday. But anyway, I'd love to hear thoughts about how to combine the theme with um, you know, either the promise and the practice or just generally Martin Luther King Day and anti-racism. Wonderful. Thank you for that inclusion. Oh, yeah. Great. And uh, thank you for introducing yourself, Eileen, Ellen. And if you'd like to fill in the chat, too, it looks like you might have, but that would be great. Chat is location, congregation, and name. That helps me keep track of everyone. Okay, and of course we welcome lurkers, but Kathleen, if you feel like you want to say something, just jump right in. So those are our challenges. 
for this month, besides just existing and being a DRE. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is just invite us to center for about 30 seconds in silence and think about these challenges and possible um, suggestions from us and from the group. So I'm going to ring a little bell and it's just a minute, of, uh, 30 seconds of silence. As we come out of the silence, I invite us to share whatever thoughts might be running through your mind. I appreciate the silence because I am a person who would jump in with solutions. I do that in marriage therapy too. <laughs> and they're like, no, don't jump in. Let's just make space for listening and being. But now is a time when we can share possible solutions, things that happen in your congregation for any of these challenges, for incorporating anti-racism in MLK Sunday, for the chapel and embracing of the gifts of diverse volunteers and the multi-gen chapel, and how, how on earth we find and coordinate resources for our volunteers. I'm not going to jump in first. <laughs> and, and, and another one that, that you mentioned right at the beginning, Katie, was that we don't have ritual for uh, forgiveness. Yes. And uh, I, I discovered that there actually is um, a litany of atonement mm -hmm. in the back of our um, our standard gray hymnal. Really? Uh, it's number six, 637. Great. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, um, it's a responsive reading in which uh, various um, sins are named and uh, that's followed up with we forgive ourselves and each other we begin again in love. Mm. Which would be such a nice reading to do in response. Great, good resource. Yeah, and I think it, it could be a model for any other uh, situation where we want to uh, um, begin again. Mm -hmm. Good. Did you happen to write down who wrote that? Um, let me see. No problem. I'm sure it's in there. 637. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Robert Eller Isaacs. Isaacs. Eller Isaacs. Lovely. Great. Thanks for finding that. Other suggestions and resources and possible reflections toward solutions for any of these. How do you find your resources? Uh, I can share a little bit about that. Um, I only have one building and only one place where books are kept. So that's a lot easier for me. But I have a lot of places all over the building where supplies are kept. And I happen to have a very motivated, um, very plugged into Google Docs volunteer come along and mm -hmm. say, I would be happy to go through all of those cabinets and make a Google Doc inventory of the supplies. Um, and that has been hugely helpful to let volunteers know what we have, which is, I mean, every 
supply you might need for the rest of your life um, in terms of crafting. And then in terms of like where different resources are kept, um, it's been good for that. That's wonderful. Um, I'll add a reflection. Oh, oh yes. Oh, and one other resource, Bob, is I don't know if you've heard of library thing. I've read a lot about that on different websites um, as a way to, to actually track a library. And I'd love to get something like that going here. Mm -hmm. But um, I, don't, I don't have a volunteer for that yet. I saw yeah, you. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually researching a library thing. Uh, and, and there's a add-on to it uh, called Tiny Cat that um, allows you to loan and, and allows people to put holds on books and so forth. Hmm. Um, and I'm also looking at Libib, which is a, another online system. Either one to do the full functionality will cost money. Um, and I'm uh, thinking forward about what, how, to, how to make that happen. Um, so, and, and then of course, the, the, somebody needs to uh, set that up and maintain it. Um, it happens that a volunteer came to me last week and said, I'm now interested in getting in, into RE, but please don't put me in front of a classroom of middle schoolers. <laughs> um, and uh, the library idea came up and uh, so, she was fired up about doing something and I just need to, need to figure out what is it we're going to do. Wonderful. One reflection I'll add is from John Roberto's Faith Formation 2020 class that I took. It was a weekend um, for using social media and becoming technologically advanced. And what he found as a Catholic religious educator is that the young younger set of parents were much more eager to get involved with technology and helping with social media and library thing and that kind of stuff than they were as a teacher. And so that was sort of a bait and switch kind of volunteer recruitment strategy he recommended to get going on that. Um, great. Good suggestion. Um, I will reflect on my 30 some years of religious education and that problem uh, is that it never went away really. And I had two different strategies. I tried it two different times. One was to just get everything I thought I could use out of the various uh, cabinets that these are library books. So we had some adult library stuff and we had some stuff in the, 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 like the, board meeting room that was just just little maybe less than 10 books and I took it all into my office because I was so tired of trying to figure out where it was so that was my solution of okay I'm using it the most I'm going to keep it <laughs> and it wasn't very um, polite of me but that was something I tried for a few years so I'll offer that um, just because we were we being the re program was the most active users because the teachers wanted the book and oftentimes they would come the sunday before and say i really want to just take the book home and read it so when i come back to teach next sunday i have know what i'm doing so that's that was just something i monitored with the teachers and then the second thing was to find a volunteer who was an older person, a former librarian, who came up and said, Katie, I notice your books are in total disarray. Would you like me to sort them according to your own categories? And she put dots on everything. And that was great. It lasted for a good three, four years before everything just got totally jumbled again. Um, so I agree, the library is something that we curate as religious educators often, but boy, can it be a time suck. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that both of you, Carolyn and Bob, have been saying somebody, <laughs> implying not me. Good, good choice, because eventually it'll happen. And of course, then there's the whole thing of if a teacher brings in a library book or you bring in a library book, 
and then it's lost in that lovely cavern of resources. We've always had that happen, and so I was always very careful if someone brought, or if I brought in a library book to just sort of grab it at the end of the Sunday and put it on my desk or ask others to do it. Because we, we had people with some hefty fines because they couldn't find them. Oh, there's, a, there's, there's just a few reflections on that. Um, other things, let's see. One of the books for Ellen in the um, resources, I think it's the elementary resources for MLK, was the lovely book about Ruby Bridges. Um, we are so, here's, here's a reflection, I'll just bring it off the top of my head. We, being um, religious educators right now, are struggling so much with the white supremacy, the white privilege, the concepts which are so far beyond anything we've done um, in the past for MLK Sunday, that you might be looking for new angles and new hooks. There is that beautiful I Have a Dream book, MLK, but you're right, maybe you want to take the opportunity to engage something else. Um, and a little bit different angle and welcome. Um, that's my way of saying, well, is MLK Sunday just running out of steam for us? The kids that I was working with in my congregation were tired of MLK because they just did it all week in school. So the school's integrating a lot more um, of that kind of thing now. And so I'd have to find a different hook or a different angle. Angle. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Yes. Uh, so there's a couple of different things. You might think of, I think I put in there, one of the service things, leadership and service things, was um, to take an inventory. Oh, no, this is something different. But here's an idea. Take an inventory of the books in the preschool. The older children can do this. And how many minorities are portrayed? How many books are about um, different types of people? That way, the kids themselves can contribute to um, the culture of, or to changing the culture in our own congregation. Rather than making it other, it's us. Um, that was, and I'm sorry, that wasn't in the packet. That's a different piece of my life, but it was a service project that I came up with. Um, other things, maybe you guys have thought of something to do for MLK as it's coming up in January. I haven't actually looked far enough. That's okay. That's fine. Yeah, because this is a busy time of year. Right now, right? I always used to feel like I was falling off a cliff. Oh, now I can think about January and January 1st. Carolyn, you had your hand up. Oh, uh, well, I heard you say, uh, is it Ellen? Yeah. Yeah, um, I heard you say that you're also thinking about the promise and the practice. Mm -hmm. So I don't had a chance to look at the resources for that but the, there's some pretty extensive resources and like my my understanding and I might be wrong is that there's a real suggestion to use the resources because they are um, especially for the worship they're focused on using like voices of people of color as the mm -hmm. main voices being heard mm -hmm. so I feel like that that might be like a, a way to guide what kind of additional projects might happen in RE. Um, mm -hmm. But I do know that the, the RE resources are pretty extensive and like their suggestion to do the activity with like breaking the chalice um, and then reconstructing it with the group. So I don't know, that was what I had in mind. Um, we're gonna do that on Thursday. Great, thank you. 
All right, someone's phone is ringing. So if you're muting, that, that really helps. If you're, oh, it was yours. Yeah, my husband just took it out of the room. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry. Helpful guy. Thank you, husband. It's <laughs> nice to do that. Embracing the gifts of diverse volunteers. You know, um, there's a lot, this is something Carolyn brought up. So I've heard of programs that do the January intercession as a more low key time because I do think it's, some of it is in response to the exhaustion of the holidays and just needing to have something a little lower key. Um, I live in Colorado and the, the um, attendance in January would plummet because it's ski season <laughs> and people would just be gone on Sunday. And, and so at that point we started doing, um, we, we never, well, we tried an intercession, but once again, that was a little hard to plan, but we did anticipate lower attendance and just a little more, uh, informal activities that I could run with the children who showed up, but it wasn't ideal. But having a diverse, having a volunteer who's sort of a um, last minute planner that I got, I got the impression that was your question. You know, you can reframe it as responsiveness. So Here's a person who's going to say on Friday or Saturday, hey, what's going on in the world? What's going on in my life? What's going on in my brain? What do I want to bring on Sunday morning for this hour with the kids? And is the packet the kind of thing you could just hand them and say, here you go, have fun, uh, decide on Friday night or Saturday, but please don't call me on Saturday night at 830 and, and expect me to help. So that's something that I usually set as a rule with those kinds of folks. I valued them because they could be so resilient and responsive. But I also did say, you know, it's hard for me. And so I will not be available to you if you don't contact me um, by Thursday was my deadline. It was supposed to be Wednesday, but then I had to cheat and say Thursday. And usually they were fine and they wouldn't call my home at 8.30 on a Saturday night and say, well, I was thinking of this. Any other reflections on that? Perhaps maybe somebody who, who would be more gracious to those volunteers. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll add about filling in when the volunteer staff gets light, that's when I start saying to myself, and it might be late, but I say, how about multi-generational planning? What kind of January service could we offer? That would be the whole program the whole all of the families just come and the minister and I do something so our January intergen we we were set up to do once a month took care of that one of those Sundays and oftentimes since there wasn't an, a real big holiday in January we would do what we called um, UU mission so it might be something historical it might be something um, from history of and heritage of Unitarian Universalism. It might be something uh, for the mission of our church. The mission of our church was bringing to life love and reason. So we tease that out in different multi-generational ways together. And then we wouldn't have to have volunteers. Yeah, in, in my congregation, we have periodically uh, had what we called choice Sundays um, in which we didn't have enough teachers to cover all the classes uh, but we had a few teachers and uh, and we had some volunteers who weren't uh, teachers who could be available and 
uh, we identified different activities that the kids could uh, do that were not age separated. So uh, we would come together for uh, a startup worship and then uh, everybody goes and does uh, their uh, activity that they're interested in. Um, we actually have a couple of youth who have said uh, we should do every Sunday that way. Um, and and I'm hesitant to do that because I think there is some identity formation that can happen in age groups. But um, but the, it, it did relieve uh, the need to have enough volunteers to cover all the classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good suggestion. Well, I think we've hit on some of those. I'd like to bring our um, suggestions from the group time to a close and do 15 seconds of silence and then we were we are going to look at opportunities that are present all right here's the bell And we return. So this part for me, where we talk about the opportunities of January, of intention, of whatever else is going, is a way to reframe the things that we've been talking about. For instance, one of the reframings that I did once when I only had two or three senior high youth showing up was to reframe my problem of only two or three youth into we only have two or three youth. think of the mentor possibilities and the leadership possibilities and the places we could go with two or three youth it's not like we'd need 15 kids to go to boston it would be easier to take three kids to boston so if we have if you have opportunities that you can see by reframing anything that's going on right now, um, reframing resolutions as intentions, that might be an opportunity, for instance. Um, I'm trying to think of the other things. Oh, I wrote down a few things. Let me get them out. Reframing, uh, I'll do this now. So if we're reframing mistakes as learning opportunities, I use puppets when difficult things start happening. Puppets are good foils because they have personalities. And this is Mr. Renard. Mr. Renard is French for fox and he is a fox. He has a beautiful tail and he's big enough to sit on my arm, aren't you, Mr. Renard? Yes. And I'm not much of a puppeteer, so when he talks, I talk like this, and I speak in a French accent because my name is Renard, but my mouth moves, it's not a big problem. But when I say, oh, Mr. Renard, I made the worst mistake, I forgot to call Bob and tell him he was teaching this Sunday, <laughs> or some crazy mistake that I would work. And Mr. Renard says, oh, Katie, it's okay. Everyone makes mistakes. And if I do this in a chapel, then he's my foil. Everyone makes mistakes. I bet you, you make mistakes and you make mistakes. It's part of life. I know, but I just hate it when I make mistakes, Mr. Renard. I know everyone hates it. But then you go back and you take a big gulp of air and you try again, right? 
okay, I'll try again. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And so the children don't have to admit that they they make mistakes. I can say that, and then the puppet, mis I'm there, the puppet, oh yes, I'm so sorry. The puppet can can help them understand the lesson that you're doing. So this would be the way I would do the making mistakes session, which is session um, two or three in the packet. And I wanted to give you an example of how I use Mr. Renard. And you can pick any puppet and you can even do your hand. It's not that hard to do a puppet as a hand because it's a foil and it's a different voice. The other place that puppets are wonderful for is the, the idea of death. So a puppet can feel sad and not, it's not so threatening with a child who says, well, I feel bad when, when I think about death. We'll do that more in balance because I wrote a, a session on um, dealing with death, life, the balance of life and death coming up for March in balance. So thank you, Mr. Renard. I really appreciate you coming and joining us on the recording. Yes, goodbye, everybody. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Renard goes down there. Mr. Renard is, he um, also has a lot of wisdom from the little book, The Petit Prince, The Little Prince, and that kind of stuff. So that's his character. So in terms of opportunities, so there was an opportunity for some puppetry. Um, I'll keep one more thing, and this is, I've decided that Almost every one of these packets, I seem to be making up a crazy game. I did it for February, and what I did was duck, duck, hug. You might not have seen it, but um, it's for National Hug Day, which takes place, uh, no, in January, it's National Hug Day. And if you know the, the game Duck, Duck, Goose, of course, so this is Duck, Duck, Hug. The children know how to play it. They run around, they chase each other just like normal. But whoever makes it or doesn't make it, they the two people stand up and give each other a hug. It's very simple, but that's Katie's crazy game for the month. Um, I thought I'd just mention that from the packet. And let me know if these crazy games work. That one's a preschool game, Duck Duck Hug. All right, other opportunities as I chat on for using intention for January, whatever has been running through your mind. Um, I can share a little bit. So um, I got a chance to go through the packet and um, I think I'm really excited about the story of, um, I think it's Masa and Nagib. It's a story about um, how you leave hurt and forgiveness uh, in the sand, but you carry love in the stone, like you carve you know, into the sand versus carve into the stone. And it's like, what do you carry in your heart? Mm -hmm. So to me, that story was very beautiful. And I feel like that might be a good for um, children's chapel that day mm -hmm. um, or for the month. Um, and then a lot of I've been framing Children's Chapel has been to like offer something um, as, a, as a group activity and then have uh, like stations where there's like a lot of free choice time. And so what I've usually been doing is going through each of the like elementary and preschool sessions and pulling out some of the activities that will complement the, the children's chapel. Nice. So I excited about um, mailing a hug activity, mm -hmm. which I think like, all ages would love to do. And I think that that would be um, something that will definitely get incorporated into children's chapel activity station. Great. Great. Great opportunities. I'm glad they're, they're in there. Great. I think the two opportunities to use the two songs 
about intention. The first is listen, listen, listen to my heart song. There's a YouTube um, version of it listed in the packet. And that is something that my Lareda chapter used to sing to each other as a closing every month after we met. And it's a beautiful, beautiful song, and it deals with finding your inner voice. And listen to my heart song, I will never forget you, I will never forsake you. And the other is return. Return again, return to the place of your soul. That's another really good um, song to use for intention, especially for youth. They just find that place in a person that is so sad and yet so vital. So I just wanted to lift those up as opportunities that I hope you don't miss. Yes, there it is. A song all my kids have been practicing. Yes, it's a beautiful song. Thank you for sharing that on the chat. Um, op another opportunity is the two super moons that are coming up in January. I always like to do, for some reason, I always like to do science in January. It just seems natural after Christmas and the rituals and the mysticism and the hope. Science just seems to fit. And so um, next month, so January 2018, there are two full moons. They're called super moons. The second, first one's about January 2nd, and the next one is January 31st. And the 31st one is called a blue moon. It isn't blue. <laughs> it's going to be bright orange, but it's called, that's where the saying once in a blue moon came from. So you can sort of weave that with the kids if they know that saying, but offering our families the opportunity to go out and stand and watch the moon come up in January, <clears throat> I think is a really important thing. It's early enough so that any family can do it. It's going to be, you're going to see it at five in the evening, most likely when the sun's setting and it's early enough in the winter. You don't have to stay up till 10 o'clock at night. And gives us a sense of transcendence to see that moon. So I do hope you'll share that with your families. And then the last thing I wanted to lift up was the book, Beautiful Oops. There's a whole cult on, online about this book. So adults and youth and um, youth meaning teens and very little children. It, it's, it's almost like a board book for little children. I gave it to my five-year-old grandson who was starting kindergarten. And, you know, he was biting his lip. He was so nervous about making mistakes. And the book itself is about the beauty of, here's this torn page, let's turn it into a crocodile, that kind of thing. Um, I usually don't recommend books with uh, things that come out because they just get ripped and fall apart. But this particular one fits so well with, with our theme of intention and making mistakes that I did recommend it. And I do recommend it to you. So, and I, I even think it would make a good, um, like a small group ministry book to talk about too. Certainly try it with the teens. It's just really playful and fun. All right. Um, we're getting close to our time and the... For, I think what I'd like to do is share takeaways. So one thing, two things that you're going to take away from our hour together today, please feel free to share. One thing I'm taking away is uh, broadening my thinking uh, about uh, not just books, but tracking other things uh, that are resources for uh, 
uh, teachers. Um, so I think it was Carolyn that mentioned that. Great. Yeah, I want to take away the idea of reframing situations as opportunities. And I like sort of like the science and mystic mix of thinking about the moon. Um, and that volunteer that I was struggling with in some ways um, also made that suggestion to families to have their, their children go out and celebrate the solstice by watching the sunrise. and. Uh, I just really want to lift up like the beauty of like everyone contributing and being part of the team. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. And I saw your note, Kathleen, that you have laryngitis. And so thank you. And there she is letting me participate. Yes. <laughs> we wish you the best. I'm glad you joined us, Kathleen. And I'm glad that we can get a few of your comments and personality on the chat list. And Ellen, do you have a takeaway? Maybe not. All right. Well, I deeply appreciate your presence and your willingness to share and also your involvement in Soul Matters, each one of you. I love doing Soul Matters. I'm really excited about each packet and I love to hear how it's going. So thank you for joining us. Happy holidays. And I will blow out the chalice. And here's the way that I do it. It's like Shabbat. I gather the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action back into the world of do and say, carry it forward into the dawning day. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great holiday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.